just not doing anything. I'll mute them in a moment. If you're joining us via the meeting, please mute yourself until you're presenting. Tom, will you check our sound on YouTube? Yes. That's who will be with us. The second presentation. When you're ready, Bob. Yeah, whenever. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the town of Grand Island. Uh, today's uh, information meeting, um, which is a uh, uh, essentially internal meeting with the town of Grand Island, the department heads, uh, the advisory boards, um, bringing the developers in to discuss their projects um, before we begin the application process. Um, so today's, today's basically going to be applicant uh, presenting. <laughs> Um, with the advisory boards, um, we can see what kind of level we get into a question and answer, but for the most part, we're going to try to keep it straightly to a presentation um, yeah, so, just to start, the, start you thinking about the projects. Um, also, give an announcement, there are town board members, both virtually in, in here in, in, uh, in the room today. Um, their role is basically just as a listener. There is no action from those members. Um, they are just as a listening public today. Um, so with that, we have three projects in front of us today, uh, proposed warehousing project uh, with, between Long Road and Vidal, um, Grand, uh, a, a proposed mixed use development, uh, Grand Island Boulevard and Baseline uh, in the area of the Supergas, and the third project, a solar project on Whitehaven Road, uh, north side of the road, uh, west of the throughway. So the first one I'm going to turn over, Mike Huntress is here today virtually, and we'll present on his project. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Jen's my, uh, everything's coming through properly now. Yep. We can see you. Um, you'll want, if you want to screen share, you have privileges to do so. Okay. I was hoping that Bob had, do we have just a site plan to be able to put up on the screen? I do not. Okay. We're getting too technical for me to be able to do that, but I'm going to attempt to as we continue to talk. So the project itself is, I'm sure everybody's very aware of the, the site that we're talking about. It's, it was the project site for the um, Amazon Fulfillment Center that uh, came through at some point earlier this year and unfortunately didn't come to fruition um, over the summer. And we were able to pick up the pieces, I guess, of a lot of the legwork that was done by Amazon and their design team. And you can see that we engaged Langen engineers um, to help us with the site plan design. And our own internal design department has produced the elevations for the building and, and we'll do all the design work on the structure. So we utilized the base plan that was put together, um, you know, ad nauseum with Amazon and, and Langen. And, and we put together a plan that is what we believe to be as of right on the 144 acre commercial site on Long Road, um, bound between Bedell and Long Road and the 190. So our company's owned this property for over 30 years. It was purchased originally during the time of the North American Free Trade Agreement, thinking that we were going to have opportunities as a result of our proximity to Canada. Um, that really didn't come to fruition, but what we've noticed over the course of the last 12 to 24 months is a very, very big demand for high bay warehouse space. We own 3 million square feet of warehouse space in Rochester, New York, that um, I guess it's really 2.2 2, 2 million square feet of warehouse strictly. And that space is 100% occupied and it has been now 
for the last 48 months. Um, in Western New York, we've seen a big rise in the demand and there's a, a significant shortage of high bay warehouse space. And there was quite a bit of interest from users on a national level for this type of space um, as we are going through the process uh, with Amazon and Trammell Crow. So we're confident that what we're designing here, there's a need for. Um, the, the site has been zoned um, light manufacturing. The sense to be developing a property like this on the I-190 throughway, just as the town has master planned it. And we've put together a 1.1 million square foot single story warehouse facility that could be rented to a single user or could be multi-tenanted very easily as well into one to 200,000 square foot blocks of space. The parking is just under 1,300 cars. Um, we've provided trailer storage of, you know, right around 350 trailer spaces. The access um, on and off the site is very similar to what was um, designed originally for the Amazon project with a, a drive main driveway coming in off of Long Road and an employee um, exit heading out onto Bedell to push um, employees, you know, at the end of the day out onto Grand Island Boulevard, hopefully to spend some money. Um, we utilized much of the mitigation that was planned in the previous design for traffic. So we've left the traffic signal that the county had um, recommended along with the recommendation of our traffic consultant. That report was updated along with the noise report. Um, as far as environmental impact is concerned, we did end up having to impact one more small pocket of federal wetlands under this design. It's a little bit um, greater first floor, obviously, um, coverage than the previous design, a little less parking, but we impacted another small pocket of federal wetlands that we're gonna have to get a permit to fill, which on a 144 acre site to impact 2.3 acres of um, wetlands obviously is a, a minor issue. And we know that in talking with the Corps, it should be fairly easy to get those permits um, due to the fact that they're not very significant wetlands, certainly in this area. Um, we've rerouted the ditch as was previously proposed and the rerouting of that ditch will end up cleaning the ditch out, which would help with the drainage um, for all of our neighbors as well. That's pretty much it. I mean, there's, that's definitely the highlights of what we got going on. I'm going to attempt to work through my screen sharing too, at which time I guess I can answer any questions or take any comments. I mean, our, I, I, I like the setup that we've got here, Bob, and I appreciate this being put together where we can get some comments even prior to meeting with the planning board on the 14th. Um, in hopes of even incorporating those comments if possible, or certainly a discussion of those comments with the planning board. Um, and obviously our hope here is, is that we move through the approvals expeditiously to get us into the ground at some point when the weather breaks in February or March. Um, the plan is, as I said, it's, it, as we can tell, it's as of right. So we wanted to keep it really simple. We didn't want to have to get variances. We understand that there will certainly be some controversy re related to, you know, um, a building of the, its size at this location. But we also know and have heard from the community, um, the county as a whole, and then individuals also within the community that, you know, it, it was really sad to see Amazon go. And first and foremost for ourselves, um, but when you look at the jobs that we lost to the community and what we could have had here, um, it was really spectacular. But I, I think, you know, one door closes and another opens and we're excited and anxious about getting something together here on this site. I think the time is right.
like just quick in terms of documentation submitted to date. Um, Bob, can you use the microphone? It should be a big help. Either one, either one. So, so Mike, just a quick question in regard to the application you provided. The, the original project had a substantial environmental review. Um, how much of that component are you intending for use in this or other? Up, I know you said you did a little bit of updating uh, with noise. Our plan is, Bob, that all it is is an update of that old application. You know, so we've we've taken and all the legwork that was done by Trammell Crow and Langen. We went to the necessary consultants to justify the fact that there is little to no change in the use relative to the application that was previously submitted to make all of our lives much easier, just as we had discussed, you know, a month ago. So we, we got those updated in the submission package. Um, so that we can immediately start the seeker process um, and, and re-engage the interested parties. And the interested parties should be able to look at the updates with the information that they've already reviewed and see that there's little to no change other than the reduced height of the building um, and the, um, there's no need for variances. So I would say those are the two big differences, but we've provided updates to the necessary reports. Mike, are you wishing to do a screen share at all? I gave you temporary co-host access. It's through a green button at the bottom of your panel. Yep, I see it now, John. So you're gonna have to bear with me. This is definitely not my thing. I'm actually just trying to do it from my computer. John, can you share your screen like readily? If I just emailed you the PDF of the site plan? Yeah. Or no? Yeah, it's fine. Just let me know when you send it. Okay. there are any other questions as we continue to dig through this? Uh, this is Diane Evans. I have a question. Hi, Diane. Hi. <laughs> um, you mentioned the environmental review. Everything's been updated. It, where can we see those updates? So included with our site plan application, we included the letter updates from the different consultants. So those will get sent out um, as part of the seeker process to the interested parties. So you're restarting the seeker process or adding to it? I think we're just adding to it, right, Bob? I mean, that was that was certainly our thought was that we just supplement the information that was already provided to reflect the new design and I will, go I from will, there. I will defer to legal of an interpretation, but you have a document that you're, I'll say, including in your submission, which is the original documentation and updates to it based on your changes to the site. Uh, and like I said, I'll defer as to what that's called in the process with town legal at the time, but that's that's how we're we're treating. You're you're basically saying, please have the information available from the prior one, and here's the updates. Those documents, Diane, we will make available uh, the same way we did before with the town's website. Um, you know, Mike just got those in in time for planning board agendas. We're breaking down the packets. We're starting the coordinated review process as we speak. Okay, thank you. Roger, if you're wishing to share, you want to unmute? Okay. Okay. Uh, question, this is Roger Cook from the Economic Development Advisory Board. Do you anticipate the Hi, same sort of trucking facility that Amazon had proposed, or is it going to be a different kind of warehouse operation? Just Our Thank anticipation, you. Roger, is it's very much the same. And I'm going to send this, Jen, to you right now so you can put it up on the screen. I'll watch for it. 
Very similar though. It, it's single story, Roger. It's got an office component um, that would run along the entire, I guess, uh, let's see, it would be the Eastern facade of the building potentially. So the building will look very similar to, I, I think of like the QEW um, going up into Canada or even some of the projects now that Benderson's done so nicely on the 90 and Sheik Dewaga too, that you're going to have, you know, a nice facade that, that looks towards the 190 that to me, when I see that rolling off the Northern bridge coming into downtown Buffalo says progress um, a, a new building like that, I think, you know, I, I guess maybe it's because I'm a developer, but when I, I look at those things, I would imagine most people see um, good progress in a community and it's great to see things moving forward. So that, that's, that's the look that we're going for from the 190 and it makes a whole lot of sense. And where else do you put distribution than on a throughway exit, right? So it'll, it'll be very similar though. Thank Mike, you. do you see Just, from your end the screen share now? Yes. So again, for anybody who is familiar with that previous plan, which I think most of us were very familiar, I mean, it, it's not much different. The, the ditch got rerouted a little bit further to the east. Um, there's, you know, trailer storage that is on the west side of the building. And the ditch actually got rerouted a little bit further to the north. I was thinking plan east, but north. The building footprint grew slightly and it's about 250,000 square foot bigger than it was in the previous plan. Um, and the parking was reduced by approximately 600 car parks. So, you know, as far as impervious area impact, it's not dissimilar to what we were looking at previously. And you can see that the building itself, you know, and the elevations, which I suppose I could probably email those to you as well, John, um, that were submitted as part of our site plan package. The space could very easily be broken up into individual spaces in the range of a hundred to 200,000 square feet. And Jen, I'll just send you this here. I appreciate your helping my technologically challenged self out. Dick, just make sure that mic's on. Mike Dick Crawford, Highway Superintendent. Just a quick question. Hey, Dick, how are you? Thanks. The, uh, the administrative offices, what kind of numbers do you anticipate uh, that being coming in and out um, on the Dell Road? Everything was designed to the code of, I think it's one person per 200 square feet. You know, so if we're thinking that there's somewhere between three or four percent of office space. Um, relative to the warehouse space, which would be fairly standard. Um, I, I would say that we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, four people per thousand. And if that's the case, you're looking at you know, seven, 800 people. Okay. There's your screen share, Mike. Thank you. You're welcome. Very simplistic, but gives you an idea of what the elevations would look like. You know, it's, you know, it's a, obviously a long building. Um, the setback distances, I think, from the residential, one thing I didn't mention previously, obviously they range, but they're up to, you know, as, as far away as 2,000 feet. But this gives you an idea of, you know, how we could easily separate the facility into multi, multi-tenant Um but it would also be something that we would look to, you know, one or two tenants if we could, um, if we're fortunate enough to, to land one bigger tenant. Bob, I'll look to you in terms of other questions or what's next. As I said, you know, today was uh, introducing to the boards. Um, I 
hope there's something valuable here for each of you to bring back your advisory boards as this project goes through its, its pieces. Um, it has been put on the planning board's agenda uh, for its upcoming meeting. Uh, that's our, our, the first step that I'm aware of. Uh, the other referrals, obviously, to the various boards that will happen um, either by request, this information meeting was to kick off. And if you had interest to express, um, you know, your groups, either participation at one of the normal meetings or to, you know, re request the applicant for a session with, with on your scheduled meetings. That's, that's, that's what I have. I, I have one more question. This is Diane Evans, Conservation Board. Um, sure. Just about the, you mentioned that 2.3 acres of wetland will need to be filled in. Yes, ma'am. Where, where on your map, where on your design is that? The plan that I sent over to John was a generic plan, but it actually, I think it, it does include, John, if you were to pull up the site plan that I sent to you, most of the plans don't show this, but the one that I sent you by coincidence actually does. No problem. I'll, I'll share that in a sec here. So you'll Thank be you. you'll be seeking um, approval from the Army Corps to do that. Is that what you said before? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you can see that there's in in the footprint of the building, there's one directly in the center. It's very tiny. Yes, I see that. And then to the south of the building, there's another one that's kind of dashed out again very small they're three separate pockets okay and then just to the west of that southernmost one that's in the building footprint you can see it's actually in purple i think yes okay that would be the third one so that that third wetland area is a new impact the previous plan did not impact that area okay um, but unfortunately we couldn't work around you know the the proper number of trailer storages to the size of the building without creating an impact there. Okay, um, let me think. Um, and you said you were gonna continue, as before, you're gonna reroute the uh, creek or ditch um, and clean it out. And will you put plantings along it like a buffer? I would suspect that we're gonna need to, yeah, to create some form of sediment runoff control um, to the, West of a lot of that ditch is DEC wetland area, which you can actually see in this plan too, that's dashed out on the west side of the site, which will help create some form of protection for the flow of water through that ditch. But certainly I would expect that we are, um, there will be plantings or other forms of control along both sides. Um, the Northern portion too, you can see there's a lot of retention around it. So it's, it's fairly protected naturally, um, but for, I guess, the, the Southern portion. Okay, thank you. But it will be, you're welcome. And Bob and John Whitney, I appreciate that you're taking this step to let interested parties, including the advisory board, uh, advisory board, sorry, to get a, a first glimpse of what's going on. Thank you. Bob, what's, what would you like next? I was gonna say, with, so with that, Michael, thank you. Um, appreciate your presentation today. I guess we'll, we'll consider this piece, your, your, your portion of it closed uh, for this meeting. Um, Back to my notes here. We're going to move on to the, our second project then. Um, Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Grand Island Boulevard between Baseline and, or excuse me, between the Boulevard and Baseline uh, in the area of the super gas. I have, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you make your introductions. And... Yes. Do you have so, someone online? So Dan, no. Dan, I've unmuted you. Um, are you able to screen share what the gentleman would like? Uh, Thank you, sir. Start with a brief introduction. I um, want to thank everybody for taking the time and, and uh, giving us the opportunity to give a very early presentation of, of a project that we're real, real excited about. My name is Roger Treadle. Um, I 
live on Grand Island uh, with your, oh, I'm sorry, uh, for about 15 years. So I'm kind of a newcomer, but I live here with, with my family. My wife is a multi-generational Grand Islander. And um, we've uh, enjoyed living here. And one of the things I think we've noticed, I've noticed, um, and a lot of folks have noticed that uh, Grand Island is kind of spread out and sort of lacks a town center uh, of sorts. And, um, you know, similar to an East Aurora or a Lewiston or something. Um, so uh, the, the project that we're, we're evaluating right now uh, is about a 25 acre site, uh, currently zoned R3 high residential or a high density residential area uh, between Grand Island Boulevard and Baseline, uh, just north of Webb Road. But, um, and our objective here is to create a town center, primarily residential, but with some mixed use commercial um, that will start to be a uh, uh, kind of epicenter of, of, uh, of that village feel, a walkable um, community type neighborhood that will uh, be its own entity, but will also draw in um, some of the surrounding amenities and businesses. Um, I, I personally have done a number of develop, developments over the last 20 years, uh, primarily historic rehabs of, of older buildings in downtown Buffalo and other places. Um, so uh, given this is a kind of a different, totally different animal, um, I've partnered with Frank Cianici and Legacy Development, who has much more experience with this, this type of development uh, in East Aurora and other places in, in uh, Western New York, as well as Florida. And uh, his team has developed some really nice ideas and, and uh, engineering drawings that we'll be going through today. But I do want to emphasize that we are kind of early in the process. We're trying to get input early before we submit it. We haven't filed anything with the town yet. And uh, that, that's kind of a, 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 an overview. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Frank Cianici, who will maybe give a little more details and uh, we're both available to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us here. It's uh, gonna, we expect this is gonna be hopefully uh, very um, uh, beneficial for us as we are uh, uh, at the stage of the process where I call it the making of the sausage here because um, the plan that, that you're seeing in front of you right now is just one iteration of several that we have um, um, uh, developed over the last month or so, and um, it, it will change again. And so, um, but this does start to illustrate, you know, the general concepts that we're trying to come forward with. Um, just to give you a little background on my company, uh, Legacy Development, we've been in business for about 20 years, and our primary business has been large-scale residential development in suburban settings. And that's uh, the reason why you know, we're participating in this, because it's kind of what we do. Uh, we've done a number of developments in uh, Clarence, Amherst, East Aurora, a uh, bunch in, in Amherst. So we, you know, we were, we're, we're used to presenting projects like this. We understand the process. And uh, this is uh, an unusually helpful thing to have happen uh, at the stage of the game is to get some, some feedback now. Um, so as Roger mentioned, this is an R3 district. So it's 25 acres stretching from Grand Island Boulevard all the way to Baseline, and it's uh, strictly uh, R3 designation. For what we would like to do, um, we're going to need to be designated as a planned dis uh, development district. Um, it's not clear to me that that is a, would be considered a rezone. I guess we'll, we'll figure that out. But we, in order for us to accomplish what we, need, what we intend to do here is we would need to be um, uh, pursuing the entitlements pursuant to the PDD. And so that's what gets us to the um, ability to bring in two uses, two to three, use, three uses really that are, wouldn't be allowable under the R3 designation. So um, just starting um, south to north, um, the property backs, uh, is adjacent to the folks on the north side of Webb Road. And so the, the, the very southern portion of the site uh, we are consider as a transitional use. And so those, that's, those are, that's 26 patio homes that 
essentially our single family dwellings that would face off against the existing single family on Webb Road and give them that transitional use. Uh, as of right, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that without a variance. And so that alone puts us into the PDD uh, sort of thing or, or requesting variances, which we really don't wanna do. I mean, the one thing that we don't wanna be doing here is, is uh, trying to do this under an R3 with a bunch of variances. The PDD is a very useful mechanism to allow us to get to the, to the promised land here. So it starts with that. And then the idea here is that we have a, we have a mix of all sorts of property types. So we've got single family, we've got uh, the yellow, uh, the yellow to the sort of west end, western end. Those are townhouses, and anything in red is a um, is a multi-story, um, multi-family building. And in the on so on the eastern portion of the site is what we would be concentrating on is to create this river, uh, this uh, this uh, commercial district. Um, we have some successful commercial activity already on the site. Uh, in the form of the speedway with the pizza shop, there's a Dunkin' Donuts, auto repair business, and a hairdresser, and they all do pretty well. Uh, they're not configured in the most um, efficient manner, but they do demonstrate that there is some support for commercial activity here. Uh, we've got, as we all know, the Heron Point uh, apartments are located immediately across uh, Grand Island Boulevard there, which is 300 plus units, so that's a, you know, a bunch of built, um, uh, you know, sort of built in support to some commercial activity there and you got the traffic coming along Grand Island Boulevard. The, um, in order for us to tr attract additional commercial activity to this site, it requires us, I mean, if you think of any village, you know, Lewis and East Aurora, it's surrounded by densely uh, developed single and multifamily build, you know, uh, residences all in that tight area that supports the commercial main drag. So if you zoomed out on East Aurora or Loose, then you'd see a lot of houses packed in around that commercial district, uh, which is something obviously we cannot accomplish here. So we have to try to do that by other means. And that for us would mean having to go vertical to a certain degree. And so that's why we, you know, in the R3 district, we're allowed to go up to three stories. Um, we would probably be looking for at least one or two exceptions to that up to perhaps four stories, part of it being in order to accomplish the parking requirements that we would do, we would want to see perhaps see podium style buildings that would have parking on a first floor and um, uh, the residential units above it. But on the, on the Eastern portion of the site, we would we'd be envisioning sort of ground floor commercial, first floor commercial space uh, with residents above it. And so there's a multitude of, of design uh, that we can pursue in, in, in trying to accomplish that. Um, but as I said, we, we still have not developed what we consider to be the final version of this plan. So that's really the, you know, the, the crux of what it, what it is. In order to create a village, you gotta have something to support that village. And so it's three things. It's some um, built-in customers, which are people who live immediately adjacent. We want it to be something of a destination and a destination has reason, you, you know, you gotta have a reason to go there. So the, Get an ice cream cone, get a coffee, uh, grab a sandwich, and go sit out at the at the park and uh, or out at the uh, the pond. We have a, com a community center that we would build uh, adjacent to the pond to give us some uh, you know opportunity for people to sort of enjoy that that amenity. And so we we would envision a bunch you know several amenities, small ice skating park, a dog park, things like that that would create that sense of place that people need in order to want to hang out there. And so that's really the um, that's it in a nutshell. And so we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. I was gonna let, let me start in with one. When, when Roger, Roger had an opportunity to kick this off and brought this in and then had me host uh, suggest we, we go to this meeting. Um, Roger, you had talked about even some of the concepts of a flex space type thing. I don't know if that's still in your plan, but you can, I mean, probably expound on that a little bit too. Yes, I think as, um, Everyone knows with the, the current situation with the pandemic and people working from home, um, crammed in a space that wasn't meant to be an office, having a uh, sort of a business center or a, a little office um, office building that uh, people could lease space in uh, would be a nice, uh, nice amenity for the community, uh, primarily for the, the residents of the, of the neighborhood um, but I guess other, 
others outside of the area could also lease space there too. But we're talking uh, individual suites as well as possibly a, a large shared space. And, and that would be in one of the, the, the red buildings, probably on a ground floor. Um, uh, that would be one of the commercial um, uses that we envision putting in the project. We also, we do have versions of the plan that have larger, the little blue uh, square there up in the oh. kind of top right hand side. That, that's envisioned as a small office space. Um, and so we would be thinking about this in terms of like the co work, you know, like the WeWork deal, you know, where you can rent a desk, you can rent, rent a hardball office, you can use a, a common conference room, something like that. So people who want to work, who have to work from home all the time and want to escape the dog or whatever. They can, you know, go and hang out there for and do some work. So that's, we think that that has a chance. I think, you know, and that's one of the, I guess, it's a good segue to this idea that this is what we would like to do. We would, we would love to be able to see this come to fruition. We have the market's going to tell us what it can support in this location, and I think if, if we do a good job of designing it and we create enough density, there are businesses scattered up and down Grand Island Boulevard that all do well. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to see them sort of concentrated in one spot? So maybe we can hope to, to make that a goal. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. Like I said, I, I wanted you to be able to expound on it. You would yeah. explain that to us. And... Yeah, just uh, I just emphasized that we were looking to create uh, a, a sense of place. People, you can, you can walk to the Dunkin' Donuts from your home, get coffee. Um, theoretically ride your bike down to tops and um, it would be a good uh, it was a good place for snowbirds to have their their uh, summer place as well you know and they can lock, lock it up and go south for the winter and uh, that sort of thing yeah, good qu questions from the group sure I have some questions. This is Diane from the Conservation Board. Um, a couple of things that we're always interested in in what's going on with wetlands and streams. Um, I'm not too familiar with this area in terms of any streams going through it. I'll have to check a map, but um, we are concerned that if there are streams and they're being interrupted that they're that you be conscious of the buffer zones along the streams um obviously you'll have to look at drainage um in terms of the pond that looks quite lovely to create i would hope that instead of leaving it just a sterile pond that you would put plantings around it that could attract birds and um, other wildlife perhaps and maybe put a bench or two if people are if this is meant to be you know a nice recreational quiet passive spot um, another concern we always have is how many trees are going to be cut down to put in um, a project like this so I don't know, again, I, I'm not familiar with that property to know how it's treated I, I, at the moment. If I can answer all those questions. Um, okay, okay. Um, I'm an actual, I'm an environmental scientist by training. So this is always a, a uh, important part of the projects that we're involved with and always something we look at first. Um, we have done a wetland delineation on the site there are two small wetland areas towards uh, the western end of the property that um, are, un are isolated and un unlikely to be jurisdictional. Um, and we believe they'll be readily mitigated with uh, um, what we're proposing to do with the pond. The pond is um, existing and it is, it's been established for many years. Uh, I think it's a a remnant of um, clay mining that may have been done in the past on, on the island. Um, so it's actually got a, a lot of nice vegetation growing around it and it can, can be enhanced. We could, we could do some interesting things to make it even a nicer amenity. 
The site is unusual on Grand Island in that it's really high and dry for the most part uh, and quite open. There are very few trees on the site. Um, in fact, we would clear very few, if any, trees. There's a few, there's some really nice um, old shade trees on the site that would be nice to incorporate into the, the, the design. Um, in terms of a, a drainage, there is a, there is a little creek that runs along um, the eastern end of the property. You can see where we're showing there. Uh, it goes under Grand Island Boulevard and extends quite a ways. Um, we are um, ev evaluating that as part of the project and making sure that we, um, we address it. And um, you know, it, it, it's actually an important feature of, of the site. It can be, a, can be an amenity actually. Um, so we're really uh, considering the green space. There's quite a lot of, there will be quite a lot of green space left on the site. Um, maybe Frank can talk a little bit about that. We've calculated how much, how much green space will be part of the project. So our, under the PDD um, regulations, though, we, we're required to have 25% uh, green space. Um, this version of the plan is- I'm sorry, it's hard, it's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, so under the PDD, we're required to have 25% green space. Um, this version of the plan is approximately 50% green space. Um, even though it's kind of, it, you might say, how do, how do you get there? Well, there's, there's quite a lot of green space all around the, the, the lots to the south, uh, around the pond itself, and in between certain areas of the, of the we try to create islands of green space. As you can see, like those semicircles at the, at, at the, um, the uh, red apartment buildings. Um, so we, we don't uh, anticipate any trouble meeting the, the requirement of 25%. Thank you. <clears throat> what is the projection, projected population? Like how many residents, if this were filled up, how many residents would be living there? Well, in this particular version of the, of the, um, the plan, we would expect it to be something like 300. Okay, thank you. People. About 200 units, perhaps. Well, it's a little more than that. It's um, right that plan that you're looking at there. I'd, I'd really sorry. go back yeah. to the mic. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, so that version of the plan is 26 single family, it's 37 townhouses, and 184 um, multifamily units. Um, but that, but I want to stress again, that is just preliminary. This is just, it's, so it's 26 single family. 37 townhouse and 184 multifamily units. And that doesn't, and that's, that's there, we don't, we have not put a number at all on the commercial yet. We do, we know what's there, but we still have to, we're still in the process of developing the right mix of commercial space. And the footprints of these buildings will, again, these are gonna change. This is, the next time you see this plan, it won't look like this. It'll look something like this, but not this one. In a project like this, and obviously things are, are there's, I thought, I'm, thought I'm up close one. Um, project like this one, to get to maturity of a build out, how, duration, I mean, it, obviously things are driven by, by, by lease out space or that, but what has been a, a history of trying to complete something like this in a, an approximate time frame? Okay, so we have to take those by category. So the, 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 the patio homes, we feel like that's a 24 month build out at the most. I think those the 26 patios is, uh, in this location, we, we don't feel like that's a, a tremendous hurdle in terms of absorption. The townhouses, we still have not made a determination whether those would be rental or for sale. They might be some combination of the two. Um, but it's same thing at 37 townhouses, you're probably looking at, uh, if, if they were all for sale, that's probably a 36 month sellout. And then on the apartments themselves, I would say that, that you're looking at at least a three-year absorption period. And so the way typically we're building these things um, as they're leasing. And so we're going to put up 35 or six units in a single building. And as that lease is up, then you move on to the next one. I mean, the demand will present itself and we scale the, the building starts accordingly. But I would say that um, it's three to four years to the, absorb the multifamily. 
So uh, no, uh, not necessarily, although we do, uh, we are strongly considering setting aside one of the uh, multifamily buildings as a senior um, building. So that'd be like a 55 plus. The question asked was if there was a target age group. Just because right. so the, the residents wouldn't have been able to, that might be watching at home, wouldn't have known what the question was. So I wanted to oh, I'm know. Sorry. Okay, yeah. you, so if you can always restate the question, if we get sure. any from the audience, that would be awesome. Sure. Uh, so yeah, so the the targeted uh, age group again, we you know the, the, we we don't tell the market; it tells us. And so, uh, but to the extent that we can, you know, we feel like there's a, a need for um, a, you know, sort of senior uh, uh, living facility at 55 plus, non you know, not supported with medical facilities, but just you know, more oriented towards the you know a senior population. The unit designs are slightly different; they're smaller, less uh, orientation on the kitchens and that sort of thing. But uh, in general, um, we would consider this to be, you know, as a multifamily, it's going to be, you know, typically a younger uh, demographic. The patio homes are typically empty nesters, so those are usually 50 plus. You know, we, you know, we, we, we built patio homes in, um, in, uh, in East Aurora and in, uh, in uh, Clarence. And, my, and the thing I always sell the, the boards on is that you're going to get a bunch of people buying houses, paying taxes that don't have any kids in school and they don't. You don't have to call the cops on them all the time. They're pretty benign, and they and so they're very low impact residents. Would you mind restating the question, Bob, and then doing the answer? Thanks. Yeah. So, so Jim's question was the actual zoning, and the the applicant is correct. Right now, that sits as R three. Uh, there, there was a. Um, changed to the parcel back a number of years ago that can, that essentially set the whole piece as R3. Bob, would you like the screen share stopped or? I, I, I'm set, you guys. Are, it looks like we're, we're done from the audience. I, I thank you guys for uh, your... Uh, Advance notice to us. So, like I said, it gets the board's thinking. Uh, looking forward to you guys meeting with us in the future. I guess the question, the only question, I guess I'd like to ask a question coming back is: it, Does any does, does anybody out there see any opposition to doing this as a PDD? What? I don't. I don't believe we're trading on for a PDD. So, twenty-five acre minimum. So we're at 25 acres? Yeah. No, we're 25. <laughs> okay. yeah. No, it's, it, it would have been that or it would have been, okay, the first step would have been a variance on acreage if you were going to pursue the PDD. So. Yeah, so I mean, you know, you know again, our, 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 our fervent goal is to not have to need any variances. Okay, but. So the, the, the process, the, the process you described, the, the PDD, um, is a actual rezoning is is how it's done so there would be a process through the town board the town board is obviously the one that is in charge of zoning so it's a an application and public hearing component uh relating to that for a town board decision okay all right very good thanks thank you Okay, so, so with that, uh, we'll bring up our third presenter. Um, ben, you with us? Hi. Hello, yes, I am. I am here. Okay, Ben, ben I'll let you make your introduction and uh, take forward with the group here. Thank you, I appreciate it. And uh, first, just wanted to you know, thank you all for having us here under these uh, kind of trying circumstances. Um, yeah, I appreciate all of your time. And um, you know, hope you know, look forward to getting to to meet you all uh, in person at some point. Um, so, um, uh, my name is Ben Broder. Um, I am a project development manager for Catalyze Energy. Um, I am located out of Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, uh, this we have uh, in partnership with Horizon Solar Power um, submitted a. Um, an app, a site plan application and special use permit application to um, to build a 3.45 megawatt AC um, solar farm um, at 2599 Whitehaven Road. Um, 
before I get into exactly um, into the project details, I know that Grand Island has had a few solar projects in the past um, that um, you've approved. And I just wanted to give you a little bit more background about Catalyze um, and our partnership with Horizon. Um, let me share my screen, just give me a moment here. think, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technological, there we go. So are, are you able to see this uh, PowerPoint? We are. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, Catalyze was founded in 2017. Uh, we develop, uh, build, and um, own and operate uh, solar projects uh, across the U.S. Um, you know, our in general, what we try to do is um, build solar and storage projects to match generation with local demand. Um, we're backed by a team of solar industry experts um, with, with a extensive development experience and track record of successful transactions. Um, we have um, over two and a half gigawatts of uh, solar farms deployed or in development in the US um, at this point. Um, we're backed by uh, NCAP, which is a private equity firm that specializes in traditional and renewable energy. Um, we, um, and, you know, what we basically try to do is, um, you know, have a, have a local approach um, uh, to allow for growth and, and product diversification of, yeah, across uh, different markets. Um, and I'll, I'll let Andy Melka from uh, Horizon uh, give a little more color on Horizon. Um, Andy, are you here? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So my name is Andy Melka. As Ben said, I'm with Horizon Solar Power. Uh, we originated this project here on Grand Island and are now have partnered with Catalyze to, uh, to bring it to completion. Um, so we are a uh, solar power and solar plus storage development company. Uh, the company itself is fairly new, having been founded in 2019. Uh, but we have a lot of experience. I've, I've been working with uh, you know, some of the other employees for uh, nearly a little over 13 years now. And as a, as a whole, we have, uh, you know, the principal uh, people in the company have 30 plus years, probably close to 40 years of renewable energy development experience with over 600 megawatts of operational projects. Uh, we've worked in the Northeast, the Midwest, the Mountain West, as well as uh, some work in Hawaii. Uh, we have a presence uh, here locally in Buffalo, as well as uh, Chicago and, and in Denver as well. Uh, so this project, if you could go to the next slide, Ben, is, as Ben said, it's a 3.45, uh, we rounded up, megawatt uh, community solar project. It's located, as Ben said, at 2599 Whitehaven Road, which is just uh, you know, a little bit um, west of the highway. It's about a 25 and a half acre project area on a parcel that's 35.9 acres. Um, that is, uh, seems to be all the, all the land we'll need for this project, uh, but you know, it might, might slightly move as we get into final engineering and, and final equipment selection, et cetera. Uh, the landowner is Inga and Jonathan Emery. Uh, they're local to the Grand Island and Buffalo area, but Inga is currently active duty in the army. So they're, they're currently stationed in Madrid, Spain, and will be for the, uh, the next couple of years, I believe, but you know, permanent residents of Amherst. Amherst. Uh, it, this project is really a pretty ideal location. It's M1 zoning or light industrial. Uh, it's, it's quite flat, uh, very little um, you know, topography to speak of. There's a couple of little wet areas that uh, we can talk about in a little bit. Uh, we don't anticipate any tree clearing. Uh, the field has been uh, fallow for the past couple of years. Uh, there's been some hay that has been cut on it uh, the few years before that. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's really not that great farm farmland. None of it is prime soils, and uh, but it is nice and open and flat and makes it a pretty good pretty good location for solar. Uh, it's also very near. You know, it's a, a adjacent to the three phase power lines that run along Whitehaven Road and lead. Uh, to the to the east to the uh, the National Grid substation that is uh, just a little north of Whitehaven Road 
adjacent to that existing uh, Montante solar project, um, you know, on the, on the east side of the highway. And so our access and point of interconnection would be off of Whitehaven Road. It's, it's a flag lot, as you'll see, if you go to the next slide, Ben. Uh, here is the overall uh, parcel, is the overall outline. Um, you can see our access coming from Whitehaven Road, you know, basically directly to the north and then taking a right hand turn into the project area itself. Uh, there were federal wetlands identified on the NWI uh, in the northeast corner in that sort of woodlot right on the far northeast corner of the site and then off the site to the south, uh, right behind the storage bins, uh, there's some, some NWI wetlands. We're working with wet uh, Wilson Environmental Technologies to, uh, they did some preliminary wetland uh, evaluation and are working on a, a delineation. Uh, their initial report shows that there's no state regulated wetlands and a couple of uh, mm -hmm. potential federal wetland areas off here on the west side of the, of the parcel, um, you know, but outside of our current, current fenced in area. Uh, this project will be made up, uh, right now it's designed as a tracking system as opposed to a fixed tilt system, which means that the solar panels are mounted on horizontal uh, tubes that run north and south, and they will actually turn over the course of the day uh, from east to west. Um, so the, the solar panels are shown in blue. We have uh, proposed a sort of a deer or agricultural fencing, the uh, more open mesh, I think it's four inch square mesh fencing with wooden posts, which we think fits the, um, fits the area and fits a, a rural setting really well. Uh, there'll be some electrical equipment up at the uh, near the front of the site on the south end of the solar array shown in some, some, uh, uh, some black boxes and some little rectangles. That will of course be uh, fenced with the black vinyl coated chain link fence as per the town code. And then from there, we would extend the sort of the main electrical circuit uh, adjacent to our access road and up to Whitehaven where we'd interconnect uh, with a series of poles to the existing national grid uh, power line. Uh, go to the next slide then, Ben. Uh, here we have shown in sort of those gray uh, areas to the, uh, on the east and west side of the, yeah, thanks, of the array, our proposed landscaping. Uh, there's already a fair amount of tree cover on the east side of the site, uh, especially in that southeast corner there, but we propose to supplement it up in the northern area. Yeah, right there, kind of in the middle of the site, as Ben is, is uh, pointing. And then on the west side, we felt it was important to put the landscape screening uh, basically along the entire run of those western fences. Uh, we have spoken with the campground uh, to the west, Niagara Falls Resort. Uh, they're basically fine with the project. They just wanted to make sure that it was actually, you know, that it was screened. As, as you all know, um, visibility tends to be the most you know, the, the thing that, that people don't want you know, for solar projects, you know, I tend to find them pretty, pretty attractive, but, um, you know, per the town code, as well as the desires of the neighbors to the west, we wanted to put up that screening. Uh, there's also a little bit of tree cover, yeah, right where Ben's uh, cursor is right now at the front of the site um, to add additional screening from the electrical gear, that ground mounted, pad mounted electrical gear at the front of the site. Uh, one thing that is becoming very common and we feel is, is really important, um, you know, I've been, I've been working with pollinator friendly ground cover for you know, about five years. This uh, started when I was working with a different company in Minnesota. We built uh, nine solar projects there, all of which included pollinator friendly ground cover. And we think it's really important to even further, um, you know, increase the benefit that solar projects brings to an area. So we will have a low growth native flower and grass and seed mix planted under the panels, which will, um, you know, once it gets established, really reduce the need for extensive mowing. It will simply be low growth, uh, low growth ground cover that uh, will provide habitat for butterflies, bees, other insects, as well as little, you know, other little critters uh, on the ground um, to add, you know, help, help add to the diversity of the, of the area. There have been studies that show that pollinator friendly uh, areas planted next to soybean farms can increase the yields by as much as or by about 6% uh, because soybeans require, you know, are, rely so heavily on pollination. And these deep rooted plants, these deep rooted, you know, um, perennial plants 
will really improve soil quality over the, the planned 25 plus years of this solar project's operation. Um, in addition to you know reducing erosion and, and runoff and boosting the groundwater recharge. So that's kind of the basics of it. Uh, I think is I think I'll turn it back over to Ben. Uh, you want to go to the next slide to talk a little bit more about community solar and, and wrap it up. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, appreciate that. So just real briefly, and, and maybe you've seen this before, uh, but um, in New York's uh, community solar program um, is uh, a way for people who, and small businesses who uh, maybe they want to, you know, have renewable energy, or maybe they just want to have cheaper electricity, um, which I would think that would be everybody, um, um, are able to uh, subscribe into a community solar uh, uh, farm without um, needing to put solar on their own property or on their roofs. Uh, it, it's basically the way it works is that um, any, any customer can subscribe into uh, a facility to, to the extent of their um, electricity usage. Um, their bill is credited uh, for, their, uh, for the amount of generation that's attributed to, to them. And um, they basically re realize a savings of, usually it's around 10% on their electricity bill. Uh, it's very simple. Um, generally there's not any kind of uh, additional subscription fee or anything. So um, it's a popular program. And um, uh, generally speaking, as these uh, facilities have been built, uh, it's, it's hard to keep up with the demand for them. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to just, um, you know, provide a proposed timeline um, for, you know, how we're trying to have this facility permitted and built. Um, it, the first town board meeting is uh, next week on December 7th. Um, we're hoping to uh, kind of kick off Seeker at that point. Um, there'll be an initial planning board review uh, December 14th, um, a hearing hopefully December 21st. Um, uh, county deadline uh, would be January 7th. Um, hoping that based on the project's compliance with the, you know, the solar ordinance in the town and the um, your existing experience with permitting these facilities that um, we're, you know, hoping for a NEGDEC um, site plan approval and special use permit January 18th, um, uh, completing uh, our, our engineering design and final design uh, after that point, hopefully, you know, going for a building permit in February and then uh, conducting construction um, from March through September with this uh, October 21 COD. Um, that's our goal. And uh, I wanted to just let you know that because I've seen a lot of people give these presentations and I've noticed that a lot of times um, people don't say when they want to build something. So um, I thought it was just uh, in everyone's uh, best interest to, to see that's what we want to do and just kind of get a read for uh, how viable that is. Um, any questions? There was a question that came in via chat to me. It was lengthy, so I apologize. I didn't get the chance to see if it was strictly a question or it had opinions within it. So I think the best and only thing I can do is read it out loud. It's from a member of CAB. It says, I'm actually on prep during my teaching day, so I have to go at 1030. So she's a member of Conservation Advisory Board. I had a question I wanted to ask about the solar park, if it could be asked in my absence. Depending on the type of technology being used, this may pose threats to migratory and water birds. Concentrating solar plants that use power towers and boilers can generate enough solar flux to create streamer effect, igniting birds in the solar flux midair. Large solar parks can also create a lake effect where water birds can mistake the area for water and attempt water landings, which can be deadly to the birds. I apologize for the length of this and destructive to panels. Question. Will the design pose these types of threats on an island that boasts notable migratory bird habitat? If so, if the develop, is the developer open to migration measures in the planning? Also, is decommissioning part of the plan and responsibility of the developer? So respond as you see fit. Yeah, I, I can uh, respond to that. Um, so this, this is not a concentrated solar facility. Um, this is a, a photovoltaic uh, solar facility. Uh, so it doesn't have the concentrated um, heating tower that that other. It's a completely different type of of energy generation that uh, we're not doing here. Uh, this is a PV facility, um, solar panels similar to the kinds that have been on people's roofs for 
uh, for for decades now. Um, and, and and currently existing on the island already. Correct. Looking just like those. Yes. Um, and um, yes, we did submit a decommissioning plan um, with uh, with our um, site plan application and special use permit application. Um, yeah. yeah, that that's also an obligation we have with the landowner. Our our leases always include a decommissioning bond and plan uh, in the in the land lease as well as with the town permitting. I was just going to chime in quickly because uh, you had you had spelled out your schedule, and I will confirm uh, that the special use permit was placed upon the town town board's agenda as of this morning. Um, so that piece, they will be dealing with that in the scheduling of the public hearing. Um, the project has also been placed on the planning board's agenda. Um, and at the same time, my department is commencing the coordinated review mailing the petition for lead agency. So those, those are in also with your location, a county referrals required because of the road that you're on. So those are all starting your 30 day comment periods will be starting very shortly in terms of our mailings. This is uh, Roger Cook from the Economic Development Advisory Board. Um, Roger. Did you uh, say that you probably won't, will not have to remove any trees or will there be some trees? It, 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 we don't think that we're going to have to remove any trees. Um, no. The the parcel is really ideal from that perspective, and you know, as, as a as a as a solar energy uh, development firm, we we do care a lot about the environment. That's that's why I do this anyway, uh, and um, so we try to we try to you know minimize as much as possible in this particular project. There's just no tree removal. In fact, there will be more trees um, because of the screening. Um, we're going to plant uh, a combination in addition to the pollinators for the screener. We're going to plant um, Siberian spruce trees, cardinal dogwood trees, um, and uh, it'll look nice. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate your putting the pollinators in. I think that's really the state of the art these days. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, we agree. One question I'm, I'm just going to, or a point that I'm going to bring out, it made me also work as a question for you to research into, but I believe the part, and I've invited the Ag, Ag and Markets Group is also here. I, I hope we have a member here today. Um, I believe the parcel currently sits in an Ag designated uh, zone or, or has an Ag designation to it. So I'm, I'm not sure how that plays in our code uh, in terms of the development. It's gonna need to be researched thoroughly. Yeah, I do know that it is in an ag district. Uh, it hasn't been, as I said, actively farmed in, in a few years. Um, I haven't noticed anything, having read the code fairly extensively that um, has any interplay between this proposed use and, um, and ag designation or ag districts. Uh, so I, I, my understanding is that um, there's, you know, that, that, that that's not a, nothing to do there essentially. But our solar, our solar law states. Okay, I, I thought that was one of the pieces in. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. I, I apologize. There's a there's a piece in our solar law that states prime agricultural soil, so I didn't know how the the designation that's currently on the parcel plays into that. Yeah, we submitted a soils report uh, from the NRCS Web Soil Survey uh, uh, as, as a component of our application. And um, those are not prime soils. We certainly will not be removing any prime soils, uh, it, really any soils from the, pro uh, from the property at all, but there aren't any prime soil to begin with. Yeah, and not to put too fine of a, a point on it, but um, the, the the comment earlier about the pollinators and, and their their rooting systems. Um, if you look at the soil right now, um, and and um, you know this this is going to be a, a nicer parcel for farming when this project is after this project is decommissioned than it is now, um, and we're very confident in that. Um, not to mention that um, the pollinators as they um, as they grow or sorry the pollinator 
friendly uh, plants as they grow um, will um, actually be uh, supportive of, uh, you know, the rest of the ag district to the extent that it does rely upon pollination um, in general. Um, and that's, you know, part of why the pollinator friendly species um, is, is, you know, an important part of this project. Uh, I have a <clears throat> question. This is Diane Evans from the Conservation Board. <coughs> Excuse me. I agree with Roger. I think it's great that you are um, that you are going to put pollinator friendly uh, plantings in. Um, I guess my one question is: so branches is to the west of this property, right? What is to the direct east? Um, it's another open field, um, Ben. I don't know if it, we have time or if you care to, if you, if we want to look at it from an aerial view again, Diane, but uh, to the Northeast is some woods to immediate East is an open field. And to the South is the um, storage facility. And I believe there's a residence along Whitehaven as well. Okay. So it's mostly vacant land. Okay. Thank you. And um, would you guys possibly be willing to come to a conservation board meeting? and explain the project to us as a whole board? Absolutely. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Um, maybe I can get your contact from somebody after the meeting. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. OK, thank you. Uh, Roger Cook again. Um, Diane, do you think you might invite people from the economic development? advisory board to that meeting as well oh sure sure that's a right and just a question on the federal wetlands you said there's a couple of federal wetlands that are impacted um i assume that you feel like the army corps of engineers will uh approve your project with respect to those two wetlands that's right Cur currently we don't anticipate touching those those wetlands uh, but a full delineation is underway and according to Don Wilson of Wilson Environmental, as well as other people I've talked to in literature, I've read um, that the, the most we would potentially be doing is driving a fence or a solar panel support pile in those areas. And that is not even considered an impact by the core. So uh, it'll likely be a, a, a simple exemption. Uh, there won't be any jurisdiction. And then there's, there's no state wetlands, wetlands uh, implicated at all, right? Correct. And is there any, do you see any um, need for mitigation at all? Any, it sounds like the shrubbery and all that stuff you're planting is, is already yeah. a positive. I just. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, you know, uh, you know, there, 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 there isn't really any negative impact uh, anywhere. And the only, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a positive impact through the, you know, diversified ground cover as well as the tree and shrub planting and, and clean energy for the state. Thank you. Any, anybody else? All right, I guess with, with that, we'll uh, consider these closed for today. I thank you gentlemen for your time. Uh, looking forward to you at, uh, you know, we've got upcoming, uh, you know, application spending with the planning board. Uh, like I said, the town board is also handling the application in terms of the special use permit. So um, we'll be interfacing with you with you with those going forward. Thank you. Thank sir. you so much. Look forward to seeing y'all.